Before we get into anything involving food, we need to discuss sanitation. Knowledge of the basics of chemical contaminants, environmental contaminants, and how pathogens spread, and how to avoid getting your guests violently ill or physically injured. Germ theory of disease isn't a joke, and it isn't a hoax. Foodborne pathogens can cause real illness and even death, so following proper sanitation guidelines is key to a successful operation and career in the food service or hospitality industry. Hello again, and welcome to Hospitable You and the Culinary Basics video series, Lesson 2, Sanitation Basics. I'll be your host for this series, Chef Jack. First, let's talk about the single most important aspect of sanitation and the number one way to help prevent the spread of foodborne illness. Hand washing. I know some of you just rolled your eyes at how obvious and mom-like I sounded there, but I'm not joking. Thorough and frequent hand washing is the key to sanitation and all other best practices are pointless without it. So here's a rundown. First, turn on the water. The hottest you can tolerate, a little discomfort being a little preferable here, and thoroughly wet your hands. Next. Apply an ample amount of soap and lather into a dense foam. If using an automatic foam dispenser, go in for two or three squirts to make sure you have enough. Make sure to scrub the backs of your hands, between the fingers, palms, nails, fingertips, wrists, yes, wrists too, and scrub for at least 20 seconds. Rinse well and dry with a paper towel. Notice I haven't said turn off the water yet. A lot of people are tempted to turn off the water right away when they're done rinsing. Do, do not, not do, do this. this. You already touched the faucet handle with dirty hands. If you touch them again now, you'll just put those bacteria back on your hands and just have to start all over. After you've dried your hands with a paper towel, use the paper towel to turn off the faucet and throw it away immediately. This procedure should run through your dreams while you sleep. You should wake up mumbling it to yourself. A borderline unhealthy obsession with doing it properly and frequently would not do you a disservice in this case. Post it all over the kitchen and openly shame anyone who does not follow these guidelines. The next most basic step is sanitation solution and hot soapy water. A bucket of both should be on every cook's workstation at all times. If the temperature of these ever dips below 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it needs to be changed, or at least twice per shift. These will be used to scrub and clean workstations between tasks and help prevent cross-contamination, which we'll talk about in a bit. The soapy water can be based on just about any kind of soap, as long as it gets sudsy, but the sanitizer solution, from here on it will be referred to in this series as sani water, usually comes out of a machine near the mop sink or three compartment sink in the dish area. This machine usually takes a concentrated sanitizer and dilutes it with hot water when you turn it on. The US Health Department guidelines say that a solution of 150 to 200 parts per million ppm of sanitizer to water are the effective range of most commercial sanitizers. There are paper test strips you can use to make sure your machine is dispensing the sanitizer at this concentration. If it is too high, which can cause skin irritation for the user, or too low, which will be ineffective at sanitizing anything, it will need to be adjusted. These are usually quat-based sanitizers, but a bleach solution of one teaspoon of bleach mixed with one gallon of water is also an acceptable sanitizer. With this one, you just have to be conscious of the fact that it could bleach clothing or cause serious skin irritation. In general, the quat-based sanitizers at the recommended concentration and temperature are the better solution. See what I did there? Side towels are an essential part of every workstation, and cooks are known to hoard, hide, stash, and squirrel away their own private stockpile. I've even seen cooks wrap them in plastic wrap and hide them in the ceiling tiles so that they're sure that they have them when they need them. To chefs and cooks, side towels are sanitation rags, drying rags, cleaning implements, oven mitts, cutting board stabilizers, and a million other uses that are essential in running a safe and sanitary workstation. And on the day before the linen company is due to show up with a fresh batch, everyone in the kitchen becomes a little obsessive compulsive, even cutthroat, about their personal stash. The most common and rational practice is grabbing your supply for the day at the beginning of your shift folding them the way you like them, and placing them in an out-of-the-way location on your station. The easier to access, the better. This way you will always have a stack of towels at the ready if the one you use as an oven mitt gets wet or your sani towel hits the floor. Side note, don't ever use a wet towel as an oven mitt. It's useless to advise against this because everyone does it at least once. But that's all it takes to never do it again. Once. The heat of whatever you're pulling out of the oven goes right through a wet towel, as if you're barehanded. If an, and if the oven is hot enough, a wet towel will make it even worse by instantly steaming your hands. Burns on the palms of your hands are not fun, and no joke. Disposable gloves are a necessity in this line of work. The health department guidelines state that you should wash and thoroughly dry your hands before putting on a pair of vinyl, latex, or nitrile gloves. And good luck trying to get them on with wet hands. 
Once they tear or you move from one task to another, you need to remove them by tucking your thumb under the cuff of one glove and turning it inside out as you pull it off your hand. Now, balling up the removed glove in the gloved hand, pull off the other glove in the same manner, trying your best not to touch the outside of the gloves with your bare hands. Immediately throw those gloves into the garbage and then wash and dry your hands again before putting on a fresh pair to tackle your next task. Ready to eat foods present the greatest risk of disease transference and should always be handled by wearing gloves. Ready to eat foods include things like vegetables meant to be eaten raw like crudite, burger garnishes and salads, and also lunch meats, cold cuts, sandwiches, charcuterie, and anything else served cold. This also includes drink garnishes too. Most liquors are in the neighborhood of 40% alcohol, and if the COVID-19 crisis has taught us anything about the effective sanitation qualities of alcohol-based sanitizers, it's that they need to be over 60% alcohol to work. There isn't enough alcohol in that vodka or whiskey to not worry about the lime wedge or orange twist being handled barehanded. So it is just as important for bartenders to wear gloves when handling these items as it is for the kitchen staff. A fact that gets overlooked quite often, but is just as dangerous. Cross-contamination occurs when a potentially hazardous food comes into contact with ready-to-eat foods. For this reason, we have to thoroughly clean and sanitize any area where things like raw chicken or other animal proteins are being prepped. And then wash your hands before you can move on to ready-to-eat items. I tell my cooks and sous chefs to treat raw chicken like toxic waste. Anything raw chicken touches needs to be sent immediately to the dish room or scrubbed down with hot soapy water, wiped down with sani solution, and dried completely before moving on to anything else. Storage of ready-to-eat foods and raw meats is just as important as the preparation when it comes to cross-contamination. The recommended hierarchy is on a poster somewhere in every kitchen, or should be. There are many versions, but they all bear the order in common. From the bottom shelf of a multi-shelf system to the top rack, the hierarchy goes. Raw chicken, poultry, and turkey on the bottom. Ground meat next up from there. Above that we have steaks and chops. Above that we have fish and seafood. And right at the top we have raw vegetables and ready to eat items. This assumes you have to store these items in a common area. The fish and seafood should be separated out if at all possible because those are some of the most common allergens. But we'll get into allergens in more detail in a later lesson. Regardless, the goal here is to make sure that if juices or food particles from one shelf fall down on the food below it, that the entire shelf will not need to be thrown away for the possibility of getting someone sick or dead. Juice from raw chicken splashing on a pan of leaf lettuce means that it needs to be thrown out. Each food type has its own specific types of contamination threats, and the threat of salmonella is very real in chicken. It takes temperatures of 165 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 60 seconds to kill salmonella, and cooking a pan of leaf lettuce to make it safe to eat is probably not what a guest wants on their salad or sandwich. This entire system is based on the cooking temperatures needed to kill the most common hazards in each type of food. Recommended internal cooking temperatures line up with this list to illustrate this point pretty plainly. Raw chicken or turkey should be cooked to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, ground meats to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, steaks and chops to 145, although steakhouses often go less than that, but only if their vendors and sources are well vetted. And fish and seafood is recommended to cook to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, dairy and eggs until the yolk of the whites are firm, and ready to eat foods, by definition, do not need to be cooked further. There are a few exceptions to these rules. Steak tartare is typically raw beef with raw egg yolk mixed in, and the sashimi at the sushi bar is very often raw seafood. Oysters and raw bars are another good example, as well as medium rare burgers and steaks. While these types of foods are often served raw or undercooked, and are safe as long as there aren't any contaminants, it's hard to tell with the naked eye if these ingredients are safe. It comes down to the restaurant trusting the freshness and cleanliness of their vendors and keeping an extra vigilant eye on sanitation practices. Restaurants that serve these items are required by law to have a warning prominently on the menu that says something to the effect of consuming raw or undercooked meats, poultry, shellfish, or eggs may increase your risk of foodborne illness, especially if you have certain medical conditions. There are three main types of possible contaminants in food, environmental, chemical, and bacterial. Environmental contaminants are things like broken glass, chipped plates, staples from produce boxes, and dirt on vegetables. Chemical contaminants are things like bleach, cleaning solutions, and pesticides. This is why a mop closet that is a storage area for cleaning chemicals is not an acceptable place for food storage unless the food items are on shelves above the cleaning chemicals. The last category is bacterial contamination from raw meats, improperly washed produce, and foods that have not been properly temperature controlled and some things qualify as more than one category. A used Band-Aid, for instance, is both an environmental and a bacterial contaminant, and a gross one too. Which brings us to time and temperature controlled foods. Things that need to be held hot for service, like soups and sauces, or cold, like salads and some desserts. 
These items need to be kept out of the temperature danger zone. The range 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the temperature range at which bacteria will grow most readily, and the longer food needs to be held hot, the more important it is keeping it out of this range. The health department guidelines here say that foods cannot be in the temperature danger zone for more than four hours. At this time, they either need to be chilled as fast as possible, heated to above 140 degrees as fast as possible, or thrown out. The precise numbers change every few years as research into the temperature tolerances of bacteria progresses, but usually not more than a degree or two. Most cities or counties have a certification that you need to obtain before being allowed to work with food. A food handler's card and or equivalent ServeSafe certification is usually required, and in some cases both, like for managers. A food handler's card is usually easy to get and comes with a fee, usually in the neighborhood of $10, and it lasts for two to three years, depending on the location. This usually consists of a short class, interactive lecture, and a knowledge test at the end, and is administered by the local branch of government that handles and enforces these regulations. ServeSafe classes are more informative and are also more costly, both in terms of time investment and money. They are essential if you want to get into a management position, though. There are always local regulations and guidelines that should be considered as well. So if there are any questions, always consult with your local regulatory authorities. Take notes the first time you encounter one of these. Absorb the information. Repeat it to yourself over and over. It needs to become a part of you, embedded in your DNA, your mantra. You should be able to recite all of this information back to your chef at a moment's notice. This is the second episode for a reason. These things are extremely important in modern restaurant operations, and failing at these regulations means that you could cause physical injury to your guests or make them violently ill, or worse. So to reiterate, the single most important thing that you could do to prevent the spread of foodborne disease in a food service operation, or really anywhere on the planet, is proper hand washing. First, turn on the water. The hottest you can tolerate, a little discomfort even being preferable here. And thoroughly wet your hands. Next, apply an ample amount of soap and lather it into a dense foam. If using an automatic foam dispenser, go in for two or three squirts to make sure you have enough. Make sure to scrub the backs of your hands, between your fingers, palms, nails, fingertips, wrists, yes, wrists too. Scrub for at least 20 seconds, rinse well, and dry with a paper towel. Notice again, I haven't said turn off the water yet. A lot of people are tempted to turn off the water right when they are done rinsing. Do not do this. You already touched the faucet handle with dirty hands. If you touch it again, you'll just put bacteria back on your hands and you'll have to start all over. After you've dried your hands with a paper towel, use that paper towel to turn off the faucet and throw it away immediately. Today, we talked about the importance of sanitation in food and beverage operations. We learned about proper hand washing technique, the different types of cleaning and sanitizing solutions, and the important and obsessed about roll of side towels in a kitchen. We talked about glove usage, cross-contamination and how to prevent it, the hierarchy of proper food storage, and the different types of food contaminants. We discussed time and temperature controls and their importance to maintaining proper sanitation, as well as food handler certifications and how to get one. And then we talked about hand washing. Again, next time we will be looking at the various parts of the modern culinary uniform and the importance of each piece. So I'll see you next time. Hospitable You is produced by Hospitable Productions LLC and all of the people listed here. If you want to help keep Hospitable You free for everyone, please consider donating to our PayPal or become a Patreon Patreon. Thank you for watching, and thank you for helping us create a more hospitable year.